How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Gianluca, aka Dr. Calcagno, and I'm a first year family medicine resident that's working and studying in Canada right now. For those of you that have seen the channel before, you know that I am currently working in the Niagara Falls area in Ontario, which is a border town between Canada and the United States. It is very common on any particular day, especially working in the emergency department sometimes, to hear from patients different comparisons between the Canadian and the American healthcare systems. So this video is one that I've been wanting to make for a really long time because I think that a lot of these things are very complex concepts that are very very hard to understand and very hard to research yourself. So we're going to be taking as many different concepts as possible and hopefully explaining it all in basic details in a two-part video series hopefully. This first one is going to be going over everything in terms of cost differences between Canada and the United States. We're going to be looking at a whole bunch of different things hopefully trying to help people understand just how the cost of healthcare works in Canada and the States and how the two can compare. Just wanted to start off in saying two different things. First of all if you like this video if it was able to help you please go ahead and leave a like on this video leave any questions or comments or share experiences that you have in the comment section below um because we'll be happy to hear from you here and the second thing that i want to say is that working here in Canada, most of my experiences are from the perspective of someone that's been here for their entire life. My experience with the American system is limited to my studies with the American board exams, and then also a lot of my family that I have down there, uh, and my time that I've spent down in the States as well. So if I get anything, if you'd like to add a few details, again, this is gonna be pretty high level stuff, but if you wanna share anything else or expand on some of the things that I bring up, feel free to do that as well. So now we will get right down to it, starting off with the Canadian system because it's easier for me and explaining everything and the costs of the Canadian system, busting the myth, first of all, and that many people will tell me that they believe the Canadian healthcare is free. Everyone go to Canada because there is free healthcare. And that unfortunately is not true. In Canada, we have what is known as Medicare. That is the umbrella term for what exists in Canada. Most people don't know that, but the, the kind of grouping everything together is called Medicare. But each of the different provinces do have their own individualized health care. In that sense, there are 13 different types of what is called publicly funded healthcare. Um, so in Ontario, we have OHIP, whereas if you went to BC, for example, they have MSP or the Medical Service Plan. Now, each of the 13 different public healthcare systems from all of the different provinces have to meet five different standards that are outlined by the Canadian Health Act. Those five standards include public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. Now, when comparing the 13 different healthcare systems here in Canada in between provinces, there are many similarities, but a few differences as well. For the sake of this talk that we're having today, I'm going to be focusing specifically on OHIP and keeping in mind that each of the 13 systems share the majority of the components underlying with the Canadian Health Act. Feel free to research the different types and, and the small differences that exist between all of them. But just in terms of staying consistent, we'll be looking at OHIP specifically for today. So one of the biggest questions that I get from people that are new to Canada is how do I apply for OHIP? How, do I, how am I eligible for OHIP? Is it just that anyone that comes into the province automatically gets this publicly funded healthcare? And the answer is no, that's not the way that it works. To qualify for OHIP, there are a few different requirements. I will have them all up on the screen, but there are the three main mandatory requirements in addition to one of a long list or at least one of a long list that I'll also have up on the screen. To meet the minimum requirements, what you have to do is be present in Ontario for at least 153 days in a 12 month calendar year. On top of that, if you're new to the province and you're new to being a resident here, you have to be physically in Ontario for the first 153 days of the first 183 days that you're a resident of Ontario. And finally, you have to make Ontario your primary residence. Now, here's the list of the additional one of the following that you have to meet in order to qualify for OHIP here in Ontario. You have to be either a Canadian citizen, an Indigenous person registered under the Federal Indian Act, or a permanent resident formerly called a landed immigrant, or applying for permanent residence in Canada and meet one of the criteria below, or in Ontario on a valid work permit and working full-time in Ontario for an Ontario employer for at least six months, are in Ontario on a valid work permit under the federal live in caregiver program, are a convention refugee or other protected person, have a temporary resident permit, or are a clergy member who could legally stay in Canada and will be ministering full-time in Ontario for at least six months.
So let's say you qualify for OHIP now, you've met those requirements and you've successfully been onboarded with the OHIP program. What does that allow you to receive in terms of healthcare here in Ontario? There's a list of only a few things and it's important that people know this. OHIP will cover your visits to doctors, hospital visits and stays, laboratory testing in community labs or hospitals, medical or surgical abortions, eligible dental surgery in hospital, that's important to know, eligible optometry, podiatry, ambulance services, and travel for health services if you live in Northern Ontario. Now, looking at this list, what this means is that there are many different medical services that people would classify as medical services that are not covered by OHIP and not covered by any publicly funded program here in Ontario. Some of those things, just in looking at that list, are visits to the dentist that are not covered in hospital. Uh, drug plans, also if you fall outside of certain types of public insurance that we'll go over in a bit, you would have to pay for your own medications if they're prescribed to physiotherapy, chiropractors, massage, anything that falls in that realm and is not on this list, also not covered. And then there are a whole bunch of different rules when it comes to whether or not you're able to see a specialist, whether or not you're allowed to have certain blood work done. Basically, these things need to be referred or requested by a primary care provider. You can't just walk into a cardiology office with never seeing them before and enroll yourself on their roster. Similarly, you can't just go into Life Labs, for example, and ask for specific blood work to be done if it hasn't been ordered by your referring doctor. One really important point that I just want to make sure that I drive home is that even if you have OHIP, OHIP does not cover your medications outside of the hospital. If you're in the hospital and they're giving you medications, especially as part of life-sustaining therapy or any therapy in hospital, that is going to be covered under OHIP. All medications in the community are not covered by OHIP if you fall outside of two different categories. If you are under the age of 24, you actually qualify for OHIP+, plus, meaning you get drug coverage. If you are over the age of 65, you get ODB, or the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. That means that anyone within those two age groups will need to have private insurance. And if you don't have private insurance, that means any medication that I prescribe you, even though if I was your family doctor, you're going to have to pay for it. For example, many people are asking family doctors, asking myself about one of the new drugs that's all the rage these days called Ozempic. It is a diabetes medication. You've probably heard of it. If you don't have insurance here in Ontario, you're expected to pay somewhere around $300 per month. At least that's what I've been told if you're not covered by your private drug plan. Now, here's where it gets interesting because we're going to be talking about average cost to Canadians, whether or not you use the healthcare system at all. Being publicly funded means that Canadians will have to pay for the healthcare every single year, whether or not they actually go to the emergency room at all, whether or not they see a doctor at all. And this is how it breaks down. So according to what I could find online, uh, spending in Canada for the healthcare budget was $330 billion in the year 2022, which represented about a 0.8% increase from 328 billion in the year before. There are about 37 million people currently living in Canada, which works out to almost $9,000 per person that needs to go into the healthcare system. Now, the way that most Canadians are charged for the healthcare is through income tax collection and a component of their income tax then gets set aside and put towards the healthcare. Exactly how much? It's about 28 to 29% of all the taxes that you're paying on average go directly to funding your healthcare. Now, as many of you could probably guess, this has to scale because people living at the poverty line can't afford to pay as much for healthcare as people that are making a lot more than those people in those cases. So we have a few different examples here. Let's say you had a two person income that was declared at $14,168 per year. You're going to get charged about 11.5% in tax. And of that 11.5%, uh, it works out to about $471 that you will spend for that two person income towards funding your healthcare for that year. Now in our second example, if you had a combined income of about 123,000 Canadian dollars for the year, you're gonna be paying about 38.3% of everything you make towards taxes. And of that 38%, about 13,672 Canadian dollars will have been spent towards your healthcare for your family for that year. At least from what I could find, the median dual person household salary in Canada for one year is about 120,000 Canadian dollars, which means that as a basement, whether or not you access healthcare or not, Canadians are paying about $14,000 per year for their health care for their family. And finally, on our upper end example, if you had a combined household income of $281,000, $282,000 for the year, you are going to be paying a 48.9% tax rate on average for the year. And of that, it works out to about $39,731 that you will spend for your health care for your family 
for that year. And keep in mind that no matter what figure this is, this does not include any non-medically relevant, medically necessary treatment options that you go and pursue, any of the medications that are not covered by a drug plan if you have one, or any other exceptions that exist outside of what your provincial healthcare will cover for you. Okay, now all of that, that was, that was the easy part. That was the Canadian healthcare system. That was the fun part. Now we try and wrap our heads around the American healthcare system and how the funding breaks down for this. So the first thing that everyone should know that probably catches a lot of people off guard is that the American healthcare system is not, by definition, an entirely privatized sector in terms of how they pay for healthcare. By definition, the American healthcare system is a hybrid model incorporating both public and private spending in terms of paying for healthcare. So I wanna start off by talking about three different terms that you've likely heard about before. The first of which being Medicaid and then Medicare and then Obamacare and how the three are all kind of tossed around interchangeably and what they actually mean. Medicaid is the publicly funded component of American healthcare that is at the state level and is different in each of the different 50 states in America. Medicaid is funded for the most part by the state allocated funds, but can also be partially funded through federal allocated funds as well, meaning that at the end of the day, a lot of it does come from tax dollars. Now, similar to Canada, even though the requirements of applying and qualifying for Medicaid will change from state to state, the criteria are about the same. There are many similarities across all the different states. We'll use Florida as an example. And what you'll see here is that in order to qualify, you have to be in one of the following groups, either pregnant or be responsible for a child that is under 18 years of age or be blind or have a disability or a family member in your household with a disability or be 65 years of age or older. Now, if you qualify for one of those criteria, you also need to be below a certain income threshold depending on the size of your household before taxes. For example, if there are two people in your household, your annual household income threshold before taxes in the state of Florida is $26,228 in order to apply for Medicaid if you meet one of those above criteria there. Now, if you qualify for Medicaid, the services that you get are set aside and described by the state that you're in that you qualify for Medicaid for. It's not always free though. There is some cases where you will continue to have a certain out-of-pocket expense, um, but it will be much cheaper than having to pay for private healthcare insurance. Now, the second term to go over is Medicare and Medicare refers to the federal level of publicly funded health care. In general, there are two different categories for people to qualify for this. Either you are 65 years of age or older and then in addition, you have to be a U.S. citizen or a permanent legal resident who has lived in the U.S. for at least five years and then one of two criteria. You are either receiving social security or railroad retirement benefits or have worked long enough to be eligible for those benefits but are not yet collecting them or you or your spouse is a government employee or retiree who has not paid into social security, but has paid Medicare payroll taxes while working. The other way that you could qualify for Medicare is if you do have some form of disability and you are under the age of 65, here it says you have to have been entitled to social security disability benefits for at least 24 months, or you receive a disability pension, or you have Lou Gehrig's disease, or you have permanent kidney failure. And I'm not sure if that's all that is entitled, but there are different disabilities that do require you or, or make you eligible to receive Medicare. Medicare as well. Medicare, like we said before, is publicly funded through the tax dollars. And as a result, every single person that makes income, 2.9% of all income of any kind will have to be paid towards Medicare. The thing is though, that certain employers will actually cover half of all of the tax that you're supposed to pay for Medicare. So of that 2.9%, some employers will pay 1.45% of that and you have to pay the other 1.45%. Now talking about exactly what is covered by Medicare and Medicaid, it's a, it's a whole other video that you could spend minutes talking about. But what I want to say is one really important thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to Medicare, there are only certain services that are covered. There's a list that you can find online. But doctors in the States actually have the reserve the right to refuse accepting Medicare altogether. The reason is, is because Medicare typically doesn't reimburse doctors the full fee of what private insurance was. And as a result, some doctors could actually say, no, we're not going to see you because we don't accept your Medicare. And if that happens, you could either be referred to see another doctor or find another doctor to yourself that will take the Medicare or you can go ahead and pay the difference between what Medicare will cover and what the doctor is actually charging for their service. Finally, the last thing that I want to talk about, the last general term, is Obamacare, otherwise known as the Affordable Care Act. It's the exact same thing, just Obamacare is a separate name for it. And what this refers to is a relatively recent innovation in the American healthcare system. 
that is a form of legislation, it's a law that says that private insurance companies cannot increase the charge of their premiums. They can't increase the cost to people that are taking their health care after they've been diagnosed with some sort of condition. In other words, a good way to think about it is that if you were a private health care insurance provider, what you'd want to do ideally is give your insurance plans out to as many different healthy people as possible because chances are they're never going to actually use it. They're just going to be paying you year over year without actually accessing the services and you don't want to give it to the people that are going to be using Using your services all the time. So if someone did become sick, hypothetically, you would incentivize people that are giving out this health insurance to charge them way more than the healthy people. Obamacare basically says you can't do that and everyone just has to have equal access to the same level of health care depending on what they're paying. You can't charge someone one rate and then they get diabetes and now you price gouge them and send the cost up way higher. Now, for those of you that were wondering, there was a little bit of controversy on different sides of the political aisles in terms of people that were in favor of Obamacare and people that weren't. For the most part, the reason why this contention exists is because Obamacare is expensive. When you're trying to fund health care for millions of people in the country, the estimated total for 10 years in terms of what I could see right now is about $1.6 trillion over the course of 10 years. And the way that that was actually taken or that they're going to be hopefully taking this money to cover it is through a variety of different taxes. One of those taxes is an increased percentage for people that are filing a dual income or household income taxes above $250 thousand dollars for the year and the increased tax rate i think is 0.9 percent but if someone wants to correct me please feel free to do so okay so great that was a roundabout long-winded explanation to basically say that if you qualify for publicly funded health care in the united states you will get it and certain exceptions do abide but having said that what if you don't qualify for publicly funded health care in the united states well that's where it gets a little bit more confusing all right so everyone hang on we're gonna stay really high level here Basically, if you don't qualify for publicly funded healthcare in the United States, you have two options. Either you don't find privatized healthcare or you do find privatized healthcare. If you don't, you basically operate under a fee for service model where you take your chances and if you get sick and if you need hospital care, you go in and you pay for it a la carte, which can be very, very expensive in some cases. How expensive might you ask? It really depends, but in all situations, it's not good. From what I could see, it varies state by state and it will usually be between 1,000 American American dollars and 3,000 American dollars. I really don't know why there is such a discrepancy, but I will put up some resources to average costs for certain common expenses that you might find in the States uh, in the emergency department. By contrast though, just to be totally fair here, if you don't have insurance in Ontario, you don't qualify for OHIP, you're still going to be paying upwards of $900 for the average emergency room visit. And then if you need surgery in Canada, in Ontario, and you're not insured, we're still talking upwards of $10,000. So yes, it is way more expensive in the States from what I could find between two and maybe in some cases, three times as much as in Canada. But uh, the underlying factor here is that you do not want to be caught without insurance when it comes to healthcare. So let's say you're an American resident that wants to go ahead and get private healthcare. You're able to get a private insurance plan. There's four different options for the most part and going into the specifics for each of them is way beyond the scope of this video, but I will have a table up on the screen that justifies some of the pros and cons of the different types of healthcare insurance plans that you could get. Now, according to the most recent data that I could find online, the average annual premium and premium will define all these terms in a little bit means that the family has to pay this, whether or not they access healthcare or not, in the United States is $22,221 per family, but the employee's employer will pay for the majority of that. So much so that the average employee will pay almost $6,000 for the year in premiums for family health care coverage. So if your employer paid for most of it and you're paying $6,000 American per year to cover your family, does that mean that's all you have to pay and then you get unlimited health care with that $6,000? Well, no, that, that's not it at all. There are a few additional terms that you have to keep in mind. The first of which being a deductible. So with each of the four different options that I laid out, there are high deductible plans and there are low deductible plans. What deductible means is that this is the amount that you have to pay 
towards your health insurance on top of your premium per year before your insurance kicks in at all. Now we'll do an example in a second, but the next thing to keep in mind is what's called a copay, where after you reach your deductible for the year on top of your premium, then your insurance company will kick in the majority or a certain percentage of any healthcare after that point, such that in many cases, it's about a 20, 80% split copay. So once you reach your deductible, you're paying for about 20% of all the healthcare after that, and then they're paying for the other 80%. And then finally, the last term to keep in mind is called your out of pocket maximum, meaning that you will continue with this copay strategy until eventually you've paid thousands of dollars that year and your insurance company says, all right, after this point, we will pay for everything else once you reach your maximum out of pocket for the year. So let's do an example. Just for the sake of even numbers, making this as easy as possible, let's pretend that you needed some sort of procedure down in the States and you had private coverage and the procedure cost in total, all said and done, $100,000. Now let's say we're using the average $6,000 per year premium for a family. And let's say that this plan included a $4,000 high deductible 20% copay, and then finally an $8,000 out of pocket maximum, keeping in mind that your deductible also goes towards the out of pocket maximum for the year. And I'm pretty sure it's all cases, but in the very least many cases. In this example, you've already paid your $6,000 for the year premium, and then you pay $4,000 of that $100,000 towards the deductible. From there, you will do 20% copay until you reach an additional $4,000, which is your out of pocket maximum for the year. And then the insurance has to fit the bill for the entire rest of the procedure, you get cut off at about $13,000 spending for that procedure. And that's it. And I know that was a lot to talk about the American healthcare system and all these different terms, but two final details I want to add on just for the sake of numbers and comparing apples to apples here. Uh, the cost of American healthcare spending in the most recent year that I could find is an estimated $4.3 trillion, which works out to about the equivalent of almost twice as much as what Canada pays for their healthcare. The other thing to keep in mind is that drugs that you buy, prescription medications down in the States are on average, about three times more expensive in the States than they are in Canada. And that's for the exact same drug. And one of the explanations that I've been able to find is because it looks like in the States, there are more middlemen, so to speak. There are more people that the drug passes from one to the other and supply chains and such. And yes, it is, it is more expensive down in the States, but on average, there are way more shortages of certain medications here in Canada. Anyone that's worked at the hospital or has kids knows about the Tylenol shortage recently before we had shortage of tubes for epidurals, so, so pros and cons, but yes, more expensive down in the States for that as well. Now, the interesting thing about all of this and just some final takeaways, is that when you compare the average Canadian family to the average American family, you compare the at the, the median household incomes, it, it turns out that both families are, are actually pretty much paying the exact same for healthcare. Relatively speaking, people are paying about 11 to 12% of their total income towards funding their healthcare for their family for the year. But other takeaways to know is that if you are using the healthcare system a lot, then it is probably in your advantage to live in Canada. If you are making a lot of money and you don't use the healthcare system a lot, then you are doing incredibly better, just so much better in the States compared to Canada because you are spending a lot more of your tax dollars towards funding the Canadian healthcare system in order to pay for healthcare for other people. Um, I try to be as, as impartial and non-political in this video as possible, just laying all the facts out on the table. And, and those are the conclusions that I was able to reach from all this. Now, having said all that and having done hours of research and hours of filming now and editing to put this all together, I would really appreciate turning the conversation to everyone else that watched this video. First of all, thank you for sticking around to the end. To anyone that did, because it's probably going to be a longer video. Um, but I'd like to get some responses from different people. In my experience, I've seen that the Americans tend to like the American system better than the Canadian system in many cases. And likewise, many of the Canadians actually like the Canadian system better than the American system. Um, and I don't know if that's because we're all creatures of habit and we're used to what we know, but I would love to hear some arguments for and against you will help me kind of create my next video in the series now talking about the outcomes and how one system compares to the other in terms of satisfaction and patient outcomes and experiences with the healthcare system in general. So again, one more time, thanks to everyone. See you all soon. Comments, questions, feedback, suggestions, appreciate it all. And uh, everyone take care.